the last and certainly uh, one of the most uh, awaited talks. Uh, let me invite uh, Professor uh, Lata from the Department of Management Science to chair the next session. Lata, over to you. Thanks, Professor Raj. Good evening to all of you present here. Uh, it's my a pleasure to introduce Dr. Narayanan Srinivasan today. Uh, Dr. Narayanan is a, a presently professor at Interdisciplinary Program in Cognitive Science, IIT Kanpur. He's been working at uh, Center of Behavioral and Cognitive Sciences, University of Allahabad for the last 16 years. He studies mental processes, uh, namely attention, emotions, consciousness, and uh, uh, very popular decision making across multiple methodologies which he uses. Dr. Srinivasan is a fellow of Association for Psychological Science, National Academy of Psychology India, and Psychonomic Society. Today he is with us to talk about capacity, magnitude, and control effects in decision making. Post your talk, Dr. Narayan, we can have a couple of minutes at least for Q&A. Sure. Okay. Over Thank to you, Dr. Narayan. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so first, uh, thanks for the invitation uh, um, to Professor Raj Srinivasan and Professor Ravindran. And I wish the best for the dot lab. Let me try to share. Okay, can you see it? Yep. Okay. So um, today I'm going to talk about a little bit of my work on decision making. Um, I mean, compared to the last talk, this is uh, a bit different. So let me say something. Um, I, I'm a cognitive scientist, so I'm really interested in how humans make decisions. Uh, that's essentially what my interest is. And so as cognitive scientists, we study what are the mechanisms or the processes that are involved in us making various kinds of decisions. And today I'm going to focus on uh, three factors that we have studied and that we think are important and it influences uh, some aspects of decision making. Um, before I go to my work, uh, I just want to say a little bit about something that's actually very famous. Uh, in fact, it's very, this book, particular book is very popular. This is by Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. And uh, any framework that is used throughout the book, and it's very important, is the notion of two systems that are involved in decision making. As the title of the book shows, um, obviously one is a very fast system, so called system one, that presumably operates fairly automatically, it's very fast, you don't need to make any effort, uh, it's kind of outside of your voluntary control and so on. Okay? And system two is this slower, attentional, effortful system that we use to deliberate, and uh, it is slow, it is associated with volition, agency, and so on. So this notion that there are two systems and that they operate differently. And of course, the decisions that we take in general is a combination of the two systems. So now the question one can ask, I mean, many questions can be asked. One question that has been asked is, if you have to take a decision, and let us say if you have to use one system more than the other, then the question is which system is better, right? So this question has been asked before in the old the classical way of asking the usual uh, kind of dichotomy is one system is emotional and one system is rational and uh, people ask, okay, which one should you use to take uh, various kinds of decisions that we take in our lives uh, from simple mundane decisions to fairly complex decisions like, you know, uh, career, this, that, and so on. So, 
lot of people, of course, if you look, go back and read old literature or books, people will say, well, we should think very hard, deliberate, and take a very careful decision. Uh, some, of course, may say that, no, 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 actually, uh, your intuition, which is something, you know, not part of your deliberation. So use your intuition and take a quick decision. And it goes by various kinds of proverbs we have, including, for example, you know, first side, including love at first sight, for example. So the question is, what, to, what should we do? Should we trust our intuitive system? Or should, we, should we trust our deliberative system? Uh, recently, people started looking at this uh, in multiple ways, and this is just one example of it. Uh, Deister, who is at all and colleagues, published a paper in Science in 2006, where they actually gave a multi multi attribute decision making problem to the participants, where you know certain things were defined in terms of four attributes or twelve attributes, say cars. Is one example. And then they ask people to take a decision in two conditions. One condition in which supposedly they use their attention, they deliberated about these attributes, what is present, what is not present, and so on, and then took a decision. Whereas in the deliberation without attention condition, for say three minutes or so, people were asked to do something else for three minutes. Ask, and then they come back and then people are asked. So initially information is given, then they are given a distracting task, do something else for three minutes. And then they now come back and they are asked to take a decision. They are also uh, they are asked about their attitudes and so on and so forth. Uh, and the basic finding is essentially what you see in these graphs here. When the number of attributes, they're smaller in number, four, um, they made the better choice the, when they deliberated, but in contrast, and surprising to me, uh, when there were 12 attributes, more attributes to be taken into account to take a particular decision, then presumably the unconscious or the intuitive system that ended up, uh, people who did that, essentially they did not think about it, they did something else came back and then took a decision, that seemed to be better. So, in fact, uh, they called it deliberation without attention effect and said, if you are uh, even concluded, or at least there were newspaper reports, that if you have to take a very complex decision, it's better not to think about it. You just use your intuition to do a very quick uh, decision, right? And in fact, this particular thing doing, deciding quickly versus deliberating, is a commonly used manipulation to study uh, the so-called two systems approach to decision. This particular effect uh, has now a history now. Uh, there have been failed replications of this effect. But in terms of our own work, we started looking at this whole notion of intuitive system or what they called unconscious thought. And there are two core assumptions about this so-called unconscious thought theory. One is this system is supposed to have kind of unlimited capacity. Uh, it doesn't, it's not capacity limited or it's not affected by attention. That's another way to say it. And presumably whatever weighting of attributes is done to eventually arrive at a decision is optimal in some sense. We proposed, uh, this is my student, Dr. Sumita Mukherjee, who at that point was a student, now he's an assistant professor at IIT Delhi. Um, we proposed that this doesn't gel with what we think, that people probably don't have anything like unlimited capacity and it's a simple subsampling heuristic that is focusing on a very small number of attributes is sufficient to produce data that would fit with. Uh, essentially fit with behavioral data. So our issue was, since we study attention, that this is this is the part that uh, we don't agree with, or it's not um, accepted. So we looked at it by using very, very simplistic or simple algorithms, really. And uh, essentially, we took data from, essentially, uh, we took a couple of data sets 
But this is a data set which they gave about cars. There are four cars, has been Kaiwa or whatever. There are 12 attributes and basically show, uh, said whether this particular attribute is present in that car or absent in that car. That's a very, pretty simple information. So what we did is we did four types of very simple algorithms, nothing complex like machine learning or anything. One is essentially we uh, sampled these out of these 12 attributes, uh, one attribute or two attributes at the time or three or four, which is in the x-axis, the number of attributes. We either randomly sample these attributes arbitrarily quickly, or we, there, there is information about which attributes are more important or less important according to human subjects. We use that to do weighted sampling. That is, uh, we either do random or some kind of weighted sampling. And we combine this information. We simply uh, calculated how many features or attributes are present or absent, which is one possibility. Or even in combining them, we can just simply do a weighted combination, a linear weighted combination of these attributes. But it doesn't matter which one we used, all four of them, uh, as you can see, by the time you get to three attributes, the car that is supposedly optimally better essentially was picked by more number of times. I mean, we ran this simulation thousands of times, and majority of the times, uh, even with three attributes, uh, across even these minor variations in the algorithm. Let me just show you uh, behavioral data and see how our simulation results match. Uh, at the top in the table is what you see of the behavioral results from the three different experiments. We use the same problem, the four car problem. And you can see that well, the hand stone is picked uh, by majority of the participants. Uh, but if you look at simulation results, even three attributes that are randomly picked out of the 12, and then you combine information from them, essentially that result fits with behavioral data. So there is no need to postulate that somehow intuitively people take care of all the information, in this case, all 12 attributes, and somehow optimally combine them. But that doesn't even fit with the behavioral data. It's this assumption or is not even needed. So we essentially argue simply subsampling. Most of the time, uh, humans use certain simple heuristics and just in this particular example, subsampling can lead to decently correct choices, even though information about 12 attributes are present, just looking at three attributes is sufficient to explain uh, the behavioral data. And there is no need to postulate something like infinite or very large capacity and conscious or intuitive thinking or what. Um, so, and whatever you may call unconscious or conscious thought or intuitive or deliberative thought or whatever terminologies you may use, you probably focus on a small set of attributes to arrive at uh, a fairly decent, satisfying decision. So basically our argument is that these kinds of paradigms and tasks conflict, notions about attention and consciousness, and uh, this particular paradigm may not even be even assuming there is some intuitive or unconscious thought to measure uh, this particular aspect. Uh, I mean, basically, we have also done uh, follow up experiments on other kinds of things, with us simply arguing that in most of the cases where people think that you need to postulate two kinds of system, contrary to what uh, uh, I mean. Professor Daniel Kahneman has shown or has argued for that it may not be needed, at least in most cases, to propose. Them. So we are very skeptical of this notion of two systems, even though I know uh, it's very popular and there are a lot of people who you know use it. And it's actually a fairly popular idea in the in among people, actually. Let me move on. Um, the other kinds of things we have looked at is if you look at the effects of magnitude, and we have looked at it in a couple of different ways, uh, in a couple of domains. Along, uh, uh, I have done this along with Sumit, and 
let me quickly go back. One common phenomena that has been studied uh, in the context of prospect theory, for example, by uh, Kahneman and Kirsty, is a well-known notion of loss aversion. So, of course, here you see the typical uh, function that you see in prospect theory. Basically, the, the thing is that if you compare uh, equal amounts of gains and losses and see which is has more value or which affects you more, uh, the general idea is that losses affect you more than gains. Uh, and this, of course, is known as loss aversion. And this is a quote from a paper by McGraw et al. Uh, in 2010. This particular asymmetry in terms of losses and gains, they say the asymmetry is commonly thought to occur because people expect the pain of losing something to exceed the pleasure of gaining. So interestingly enough, if in the literature, this is actually a behavioral finding, but sometimes people use it as a mechanism or even an explanation for certain things that people do or do not do. However, this has been contested as well uh, in many ways, and I'm going to focus on only one particular aspect here, and that is magnitude. So there was a study by Harnick uh, and colleagues in 2007. They asked two groups to rate small magnitude gains and losses, and then they found using a bipolar scale, that is a scale that goes from a negative number to a positive number. And they showed that gains are valued or were given a much higher value than losses. Now, McGraw et al. coming back with the, uh, and talking about this result argued that actually speaking, you get these deviations from loss aversion predictions because of the nature of measurement method used. So that because this is a, what we normally in psychology or behavioral economics would call a bipolar scale. Um, it's actually if you use a relative scale or a mono single, uh, you know, simply a scale that goes from zero to say some maximum then you will not get this result. And that's what they argued in their 2010 paper. Okay, so um, in 2017, I mean, we did this study, me and Sumit and a couple of other colleagues, uh, we did four experiments and uh, we used two kinds of uh, paradigms. One is the typical gambling type scenario where you have to make a choice between two gambles and you may gain or lose. And in the other case where we fixed a reference price for some particular product, and then we talked about either increase in price, which is like a loss, and a decrease in price, which is like a gain. Um, taking the arguments by McGraw and colleagues, we used unipolar scales, essentially a scale that goes from say one to five or some you know, positive integers or numbers, or a relative intensity scale. Uh, I will tell you what a relative intensity scale is. And since they argued this is the best method to capture loss aversion, we also used essentially what they recommend. And you can see uh, this is from experiment one. This is presented in one particular way. On the y-axis, you have intensity of feelings averaged which of course can go from one to five. On the x-axis, you have the magnitudes. That is, you can essentially you can have like gains of five rupees versus loss of five rupees. Here it would be gain of 500 rupees versus loss of 500 rupees. And essentially what we found is that small magnitudes, gains actually their value more. They, the feelings of emotional feeling that they express they thought they would have if they gained five rupees was more than losing five rupees. So for small magnitudes, it's actually the other way around. Uh, we do not, not only we do not have loss aversion, we actually have a bit of a gain difference. Of course, as the magnitude increases, in this case, uh, these are done with students with small amounts uh, for purposely, 
um, because they don't handle very large amounts in their life too much. Uh, by 500 rupees, you start seeing hints of loss of motion. Um, at 500 rupees, or maybe in, in this experiment at 500, or sometimes at 250. If we convert this unipolar scale, one to five, to a relative intensity scale. So take when they said gain is valuable or have will have, you know, produce a more intense unit than loss, which is grain greater than loss, or gain is equal to loss, the ratings are same, or gain is less than loss. Let's convert this into a three, you know, kind of categorical scale, a relative intensity scale, and then replot the data. Again, you see, of course, a lot of times, because these magnitudes are small, uh, they are actually saying it doesn't really matter, gain or loss, which is expected by them. But what is important to see is how many times, how many percentage of participants they say gain is greater than loss, which is, say, here 30%, and here it's you know, um, 5 to 10%. Now, you can see it reverses at 500 degrees. So, Essentially, what we showed is that for small magnitudes, we do not have loss of motion. In fact, we may have gain preference. And at large magnitudes, maybe Megra and Daniel Kahneman and other colleagues are right, that you actually get loss of motion. But the phenomena of loss of motion is magnitude dependent. It is not something that's universal across all possibilities. We also did two other, uh, three other experiments. Uh, data from a couple of other experiments are shown here, but essentially all of them show the same pattern. Again, in this case, we directly gave a relative intensity scale to participants. Again, you see the same pattern. Now, one, when you give a relative intensity scale, you can see that as the magnitude increases, the gain equal to loss proportions go down, which is unexpected. But what you see is here there is no loss aversion. Gain greater than loss, is, there are more participants than grain less than loss. And by the time we get to 500, it reverses. You see typical loss aversion. The, this is, of course, typical gambling type uh, questions, right, in terms of choices. Uh, a more realistic one is to look at something like price changes. You know, people say some price, and then suddenly you go, there are discounts or sometimes prices increase. Uh, it happens online or it happens in the you know, shop as well. So when you when we phrase it in terms of price changes and then look at you know, manipulated magnitudes, again, we get a similar result. Uh, there is no, maybe a bit of not so big grain preference or definitely no loss aversion at small magnitudes. But you start seeing uh, some, actually, you don't even see any loss aversion even at 500 in this particular experiment. So, literally, loss aversion was not present in this particular experiment when we use price changes rather than a gambling type scenario, which is fairly common in behavioral economics or decision making literature. What we have done more recently is to change the domains uh, and then see what happens. So one of the things we are always interested in is time. We always make calculations about time. Right now, I'm thinking hopefully I will finish my talk in 40 minutes. Uh, we stand in queues, uh, evaluating time. We travel and we look at time. Sometimes we lose time. Sometimes we are early, sometimes we are late. So the question is that whether the kind of decisions we take it with respect to time into consideration, and we do that fairly commonly in our life, whether we see these phenomena like loss aversion and risk aversion uh, with time as well. Uh, the answer generally is kind of yes, to some extent, although the results have been somewhat mixed, but we essentially looked at the same kind of magnitude effects with time. So in this particular experiment, essentially the problem is posed in terms of two queues, and then people are, uh, uh, you can have gain or loss of time because one queue move fast or one queue move slow or could move slow, and then we looked at various magnitudes of gains. And of course, 
all these options were shown to the same subject and the order was randomized across points. So this is what we call a within subject, the same subject. Really. And on the y-axis, again, you have percentage of participants. On the x-axis, you have time and minutes. And we get the same effect again, which we saw with money earlier. The small magnitudes of time, you actually, people actually say that uh, gain, uh, which is in black bars now, uh, has a much larger effect than loss. So we actually see a gain preference at small magnitudes uh, when we are taking decisions of our time. At larger magnitudes, say one, I mean, for us, a Q, um, you know, two and a half hours is very long. Uh, again, a loss of two and a half hours. That's happened in India. And uh, here you see that you have loss aversion. So more participants feel that more, there will be more effect of loss than gain. But interestingly, while we do see loss aversion at larger magnitudes, we do not see it. We see the opposite with smaller magnitudes. Now, it's not simply the case that, again, you know, to see whether the effect would generalize, we also looked at other domains in which we take make decisions about time. So these two on this on the right are examples of results from essentially a, a travel type scenario where you are traveling and then either from, in this case, just to travel without saying uh, anything about purpose. And again, what you see is that there is gain preference at small magnitudes and not even loss uh, preference at small, these magnitudes. Of course, we gave a reference point. I think it was 45 minutes to, to take time uh, to travel wherever uh, you are going to and fro in this particular example. We changed the uh, scenario where people are going from work to home versus home to work with the general notion uh, if you're traveling from home to work, it's more important for you to reach on time. There is much more pressure on you versus uh, it's much more consequential. Whereas if you're going from work to home, it's generally less, less consequential. And this is what you see there. As you see there, now the effect is dependent, uh, but it is dependent on magnitude as well, but it is also dependent on um, whether you are going from home to work or work to home. So loss aversion is more if you are going to work and less if you're going back home, okay? And of course, if the magnitude increases, the loss aversion magnitude increases even more. So you do get loss aversion results with time. Uh, so this effect with money generalizes to some extent. But it's also the case, it's still dependent on magnitude and it changes as a function of magnitude and it also changes a function of consequence. We have also looked at risk aversion uh, with respect to time. Uh, essentially, we used some kind of a travel app scenario, which is it's like a bit of a, like a Google map. Uh, two routes are shown. The two options are shown at the bottom here. We did two experiments. One experiment in which it says if you take this route, which is 1.2 kilometers, it takes five minutes or whatever number of minutes. Uh, in another case, uh, it takes, of course, more or less. And then people are supposed to pick either the sure option or the you know, risky option. And then we can see, depending on the proportion of time people choose the sure option versus the risky option, whether there is risk aversion or not. And we also manipulated the magnitude of the time, since we know uh, magnitude influences this conversion anyway, um, from 10 minutes to 180 minutes, okay? And the uh, risky option, I mean, the magnitude, uh, the proportion essentially changes in terms of small changes. So for example, uh, let's take an example, 180 minutes, it can be 150 or 210, or it can be 90 or 270. Even though the mean is the same here, the two endpoints of the range are uh, 
different. There is more variance here and less variance here. We also change the terminology words in terms of R. In experiment one, we use R. In experiment two, we use two. The simple logic being R means it's, a, it's binary, either this or that. Two means it could be any any time between this range of uh, interval that is specified here. What do you find? Well, again, uh, we do find risk conversion for larger magnitudes, especially when we use R. As you can see here, people go for the surer option more than the risky option for 180 minutes. This, I, we just plotted the two endpoints here, just to make the point. Uh, we actually did a logistic regression, and essentially the results show that magnitude as influences risk aversion. Uh, the percentage of change uh, did not matter much, or at least it wasn't significant here. Then we change simply the word R to two, which essentially means the whole possible range of times are possible. Of course, the mean is still the same. Uh, so here what happens? Now here what happens is that you have both an effect of magnitude and also an effect of how much change there is. Um, but you do get risk aversion with time. Okay, let me see how much I have. I have five minutes. Okay, so this is the yeah, last one. Uh, yeah, sorry. Do I have five minutes? Yes, bro. Okay. Um, so we are going to look at, uh, we looked at control and we have done it in multiple ways. I'm going to present a very simple experiment here. Um, uh, we are doing a much more realistic game type uh, study, which I actually show similar results, but I'm not going to present it because it's not fully complete idea. Um, essentially, the basic idea of temporal discounting is something that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, that if I ask you to make a choice between a small immediate reward versus a long, a de long a delayed but larger reward, um, people a lot of times go for the smaller immediate reward. You will say they are not patient, uh, this is uh, called impulsivity, and this is something that can be measured in participants using something called a discount rate K. Um, essentially using a fairly simple formula, which is B, which is the small reward A, is the large reward B, is the delay. This is, and um, people have argued that the, this discounting is hyperbolic. Um, you're not going into the actual discounting function, uh, which is better or worse here. But here, the, our interest is slightly different. Um, one way to do it in the lab is, is to use essentially a questionnaire, uh, 27 items, 27 choices actually, uh, which has been used by Kirby and colleagues, which fits the small immediate reward with the large delay reward. The three levels of reward magnitude, small, medium, and large. I will show you an example in the next slide. What we did is one important issue to understand control is to look at variance. I mean, the more variance you have in a system, uh, things vary a lot, it becomes much more difficult to control. In okay, so just using that intuition, not nothing more than that, we manipulated uh, levels of variance uh, in experiment one, two levels, and experiment three, three levels. So this is essentially um, what we used. All you need is to simply read one row, the presentation order is randomized. This is just one example given here. So just to understand this, this essentially asks if you have, if you uh, want to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, 578 rupees today, or you just now are given a range of uh, rupees, 560 to 630 rupees after a certain number of days. In fact, in this example, it's 186 days. Uh, the mean, by the way, is fixed um, and uh, something that is controlled for. But what we manipulate is the variance. So at two, two, maybe both levels of variance, the means, the expected values are the same. We measured this parameter k, and this is, of course, calculated and shown here um, on the last column. Okay. 
Um, of course, we do this experiment with participants and we measure this parameter k and what do you do? Well, in, in experiment one, there are three levels of magnitudes, different ranges of rupees. Uh, they had originally done it dollars, which is converted into rupees. So, which is a parity. Um, um, yeah, yes. Hello. Who says? Okay. Um, and essentially, with uh, small, uh, medium, and large magnitudes, we did not get any effect of variance. But with small magnitudes, we did get uh, an effect of variance. That is, the k value was larger when the variance increased. That is, uh, to put it simply, that when there was more variance, uh, then people became more impulsive. When we increase the number of variance levels, uh, now we have three levels of variance, we added one more, and of course this we could do only with large magnitudes, and we needed the experiment. Now we get an effect of variance even with large magnitude, essentially, showing that k value is larger here, significantly compared to this. So, the basic conclusion here is that as the variance, as the system in which you live, so to speak, has a lot of variance or noise, things are changing rapidly, then people become more impulsive. They go for an immediate um, um, you know, reward in this particular case, and we think it's a common mechanism that people use um, and can explain certain other results that people have used uh, to study various kinds of things, including decisions made by poor people and so on. Okay. Um, so to conclude, uh, the notion of two systems is fairly popular in decision-making literature, but we would like to argue that it's not necessary to propose two systems especially one powerful, intuitive, unconscious system to explain decision making. And it's very important to study different factors uh, to explain how we make decisions. Thank you. Um, now I'm free to answer questions. Sorry, I probably exceeded my time. Uh, no problem, Prof. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a very insightful talk on uh, largely loss or uh, risk aversion. Uh, let's see if we have uh, any reactions or questions. I do not see anything in the yeah, uh, uh, Professor Raj, yeah. Yes. So, uh, uh, Professor Narayanan, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, I had really two slightly you know, different questions. One was uh, this idea of uh, mean variance optimization, which seems to be you know, kind of widely used in certain domains, particularly finance. Uh, do you see any analog to that at all? Because I think uh, in this, I I don't know. I mean, I guess uh, it could, but um, see, part of the problem is I'm not sure with real decision making experiments that we could make uh, hmm. where we control for multiple factors. Um, hmm. I can see the analogy, uh, hmm. but I don't know whether I can surely say that. Uh, they are very similar, but uh, it's, it would be interesting to check it out. Right. Uh, and, then the, and then the second part of my question was, uh, so if the if you think of a, a decision making algorithm like the classifiers uh, or other tools that uh, the previous speakers talked about, sure. if the accuracy of that is the quantity which is variable, meaning on certain occasions it's perfect, whereas in other occasions it's totally, you know, off. Uh, would this idea of loss uh, aversion uh, apply to that context as well? I have no idea. In fact, uh, uh, I, I do not know whether... See, part of the problem is that uh, the loss aversion is about, assuming uh, it's when it's there, is about the kind of emotional feelings we have, right, about losses that we don't want to lose too much because it has certain kinds of implications uh, for us. Um, now, unless the machine learning algorithm brings in factors like affective or emotional consequences, which they normally don't do, because most machine learning algorithms, if it is supervised, simply going to say, well, 
these are the two decisions, two classes, and there's no explicit um, representation of effective consequences at all in most machine learning algorithms, or at least that one I know, uh, the ones, at least the standard ones. Sure. You know, there are some people who try to do certain things in effective computing and all that. In generally speaking, uh, because loss aversion is really related to emotions, and unless you start bringing in the presentations of emotions or emotional feelings explicitly into these algorithms, I'm not sure how um, they are going to show it. I mean, I guess one can cook it up in some sense explicitly, uh, but whether it will arise as a natural consequence of decision making uh, is something I'm not sure. I'm not optimistic at this point, but I may be wrong. I don't do machine learning. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, maybe others who are experts on machine learning uh, can say something about it. <laughs> sure, that's a fair point. Anybody else? All right. If you if others don't have, I have a couple of questions, Dr. Narayanan. Sure, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, how would you uh, address uh, the? Uh, questions on reductionism on how we model some of these uh, things. As you rightly said, we don't really model uh, effect and uh, somehow we can do that, if not uh, accurately at least. Uh, how do you address uh, uh, the allegations of reductionism on our approaches? <laughs> That's a philosophical question. Uh, well, I mean, um, it depends on what you mean by the word reductionism, right? In science, the word reductionism is used in certain different ways. Um, uh, for those of you who are familiar with how the word is used, right? Um, if reductionism in that sense can happen, it's it's been a philosophical question which is more than thousands of years old, and the answer remains open. We do not know yet. I mean, we keep debating about this. Uh, the general idea of uh, doing science, at least in some aspects of science, where reductionism has been uh, reasonably successful. Okay, I won't say fully successful, but reasonably, reasonably successful. Uh, like, for example, physics or chemistry, where you can try to reduce what you see as a macro property to uh, as arising out of interactions between certain properties at the micro level. Um, even there, it is just simply not possible. As uh, somebody has pointed out, why people keep saying that everything, for example, is based on quantum mechanics, I don't think anybody is ever going to write all the equations to show how a car runs using all the elementary particles in a car. It's just, it's just a belief in principle that it's possible, but I don't think anybody is practically ever going to do it, and no computer is ever true. going to run that simulation. Uh, so the issue very, very is that true. we believe uh, what normally happens even in those cases is that uh, here the scale, there the scale is in terms of size, right? So usually speaking, you have smaller uh, particles, let us say, and you are trying to explain, say, electrons or protons, and you are trying to explain something at the atomic level or something at the molecular level, or maybe a bit larger than that. Usually, there, of course, it's successful, right? So, reduction okay. works there. Even there, there are issues which I will not say anything about right now. But at least that's where we can see. Yeah. So, the issue in human of. Processes. So, in principle, um, what normally as scientists we can do, and we do do that is to see whether something works or not, ultimately it has to be tried. So if I am a reductionist, then all I can do is apply the techniques of reductionism that I have, and then see how far I can go. What are the limits of knowledge that I can reach? So I would not be too pessimistic as well and say we should not try reductionism because eventually things may not reduce at all. That also doesn't make too much sense uh, in, in, in a pragmatically. So 
the way we look at limits of knowledge is to see whether we can theorize, we try up different approaches and see how far we can go and establish the limits of whatever knowledge we have in whatever domain of science that we are looking at. In my case, it's of course the study of mind since I'm a cognitive scientist. Uh, we have a very long way to go. So this is something we keep debating a lot, both in classes and amongst us for hours and hours without any answer. So I can't I, give I, a, uh, an answer. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very difficult to conclude. It, it was more in terms of human processes because we have more than 400 different fallacies and biases to work with, not just the loss aversion, especially sure. in social scenarios of altruism, pro-social behavior, where, where we are willing to take and accept loss. Yes. Uh, so in that context, I think uh, uh, I think we are well past time. So thank you so much. I do not have further questions uh, from the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Narayanan. Uh, over to you, Raj. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for patiently listening to <laughs> Thank you, Professor Narayanan, and uh, thank you, Lata, for chairing the session. Now, let me uh, uh, turn over the last uh, session, which is basically a wrap up of everything we have discussed over the last uh, four talks, including the three today and the one yesterday. Uh, to so to do the wrap up, uh, I invite uh, Professor Babji Srinivasan, who is with the Department of Applied Mechanics. Babji, yeah. over to you. Yeah, thank you, Raj. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers for wonderful delivering wonderful lectures. And uh, in a sense, uh, broadly, uh, all the speakers were talking about uh, you know the uh, the interplay between human interplay of human factors and inherent risks arising from you know workplaces if I have to put it in a broad context. And I think that specifically the, you know, the uh, goal of, uh, or the, one of the overarching goal of uh, DART lab to address those issues, the, which uh, issues such as risks coming out of interplay. And, you know, starting from, uh, you know, the yesterday's speaker, uh, Professor Jamison, who gave an idea about overview about all the, you know, verticals, I would say, starting from aviation, process industries, how this, you know, trust, the relation between trust and automation. And uh, you know, that was a talk kind of set up a place where we, we see the domain uh, where all where all this kind of problems arise. And that was followed well by today's first speaker, um, you know, uh, Kastiko Pullas, who talked about the models, the critical aspect following up, you know, right after the, you know, the problem setting, the models which are definitely needed to solve this kind of, you know, problems. So, you know, I, I see that, you know, there is a, a bottom up and the top down approaches that there are simplistic models and then fine grained models, which are specific to domain. And that was a, a wonderful talk giving about an overview of the modeling part. And then it was followed by, you know, Dr. Manish, who was giving use cases, which actually is precisely the requirement at that stage to see where all these models in this broad area, how does it pan out? And that's where, you know, uh, the talk by Mani Dr. Manish comes out and you know explained how uh, this across the domains i especially in the use cases in finance domain applies and finally the interesting talk, talk by uh, professor narayanan asking about fundamental questions that are you know challenging questions that are a part of this is you know usually the hidden part of this uh, you know the entire uh, built up so that was also wonderful which you know tries to close all the you know starting from the bottom up uh, top all the domains and finally to narrow it down to these you know minute or you know the scientific questions challenging questions i know i and, and it was well in our line with our you know the dart lab goals where we are trying to address you know uh, this interplay cha challenges between human factors and risk in all verticals in most of the verticals and i again thank the speakers to you know for uh, giving such lectures and yeah thank you everyone uh, over to you raj Okay, so that uh, brings to a close the inaugural lectures, but I certainly hope that this is only the beginning of a long series of interactions you will have with all the speakers, but also with the industry and other, uh, uh, with the government and, and so on. So with that, uh, Raj, thank you all. Just to add one more thing, uh, Go ahead. we have two uh, speakers. Uh, perhaps just a note on how we are actually looking to kind of create a community that uh, of external uh, people in other universities, international as well as national,
who will continue to be affiliated with that in a more formal capacity. Um, perhaps uh, just a word on that. Yes, so, so um, uh, uh, thanks for the reminder, Nandan. So uh, I think it's, uh, like I mentioned in the opening remarks yesterday morning, yesterday evening, uh, the idea that uh, uh, we need to incorporate human behavior into all considerations, especially when you talk about risk, uh, kind of defines itself as something that no one discipline has ownership of. Uh, we need to look at it from a technology point of view. We need to look at it from the domain's point of view. We need to look at it from the human, which again is you know inherently very complex. And uh, so clearly, uh, even though IIT Madras has interests in this, we don't think we have all the expertise acquired. We also think modern day science and technology is done with large groups, all of us uh, bringing our own strengths and fortes to bear on, uh, on interesting problems and working together to develop something big. So that's kind of the founding philosophy of the Dart Lab. And uh, so we really expect to reach out to you and uh, you know to work with all of us uh, here and others uh, to try to you know push the envelope by uh, incorporating points, various strengths, various capabilities. So uh, I hope all of you would be receptive uh, to this suggestion of uh, working in uh, uh, in tandem, working together collaboratively. Uh, obviously, there are those little details that we as academics are aware of, like uh, funding and students and so on. But increasingly in this uh, day and age, I think it's easier to tackle those than uh, the science. Perhaps the science is where the real challenge is. And so I think uh, it will be fun to do it all together. So with that, uh, let me wrap up. Nandan, was there anything else you wanted to, to add to that? No, not at all. I think Okay, so if not, uh, let me bring this uh, session to a formal close and uh, suddenly you know, stay back and we can have a more uh, informal discussion uh, once we go off the of the public live session. So uh, thank you all. Thanks you all good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.